Existentialism is a philosophical approach that delves into the complexities of human existence, focusing on questions about the meaning, purpose, and value of life. Existentialist thinkers often ponder existential crises, feelings of dread and anxiety in a seemingly meaningless world, as well as the concepts of free will, authenticity, courage, and virtue. Existentialism is closely linked with a group of European philosophers from the 19th and 20th centuries who, despite their differences, shared a focus on the individual human experience. Early figures associated with existentialism include Soren Kierkegaard, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Fyodor Dostoevsky, all of whom criticized rationalism and explored questions of meaning. In the 20th century, influential existentialist thinkers included Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, Martin Heidegger, Simone de Beauvoir, Carl Jaspers, Gabriel Marcel, and Paul Tillich. Many existentialists believed that traditional systematic or academic philosophies were too abstract and distant from real human experiences. Authenticity was considered a key value in existentialist thought. The impact of existentialism extended beyond philosophy, influencing fields such as theology, drama, art, literature, and psychology. While existentialist philosophy encompasses diverse perspectives, it is united by certain core ideas. One fundamental belief is that personal freedom, individual responsibility, and conscious choice are crucial for self-discovery and determining the meaning of life. The term, existentialism, French, l'existentialism, was coined by the French Catholic philosopher Gabriel Marcel in the mid-1940s. Marcel first applied the term to Jean-Paul Sartre at a colloquium in 1945, but Sartre initially rejected it. However, Sartre later embraced the label and publicly adopted it in a lecture in Paris on October 29, 1945. This lecture was published as, L'existentialism est un humanism, Existentialism is a humanism, a short book that played a significant role in popularizing existentialist thought. Marcel himself eventually rejected the term in favor of, Neo-Socratic, as a tribute to Kierkegaard's essay, On the Concept of Irony. Scholars differ in their views on the term's scope. Some argue that it should only refer to the cultural movement in Europe in the 1940s and 1950s associated with Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and Albert Camus. Others extend the term to include Kierkegaard, and still others trace it back to Socrates. However, existentialism is often most closely identified with the philosophical views of Sartre. The terms, existentialism, and, existentialist, are often viewed as historical labels applied to philosophers long after their deaths. While existentialism is commonly traced back to Kierkegaard, the first prominent philosopher to use the term to describe his own philosophy was Sartre. Sartre's central idea, as described by philosopher Frederick Copleston, is that, existence precedes essence, a notion that defines existentialist thought. Defining existentialism has proven challenging, with philosopher Stephen Crowell suggesting that it is better understood as a critical approach that rejects certain systematic philosophies rather than a systematic philosophy itself. In a 1945 lecture, Sartre described existentialism as the attempt to draw all the consequences from a position of consistent atheism. However, for some, existentialism does not necessarily entail the rejection of God but rather examines humanity's search for meaning in an apparently meaningless universe, asking not, what is the good life? But rather, what is life good for? While many believe that the term, existentialism, originated with Kierkegaard, it is more likely that Kierkegaard adopted the term, or at least the term, existential, to describe his philosophy from the Norwegian poet and literary critic Johann Sebastian Kammermeyer Wellhaven. This assertion is supported by Norwegian philosopher Erik Lundestad, who cites Danish philosopher Frederick Christian Sibern's conversations with Wellhaven and Kierkegaard in 1841. According to Lundestad, Wellhaven coined a word to describe a certain type of thinking that had a positive attitude toward life, which Sibern then introduced to Kierkegaard. The second claim, regarding Kierkegaard's use of the term, existential, comes from Norwegian historian Rune Slagstad. Slagstad argued that Kierkegaard himself acknowledged borrowing the term from the poet Wellhaven. According to Slagstad, Kierkegaard stated that, Hegelians do not study philosophy, existentially, to use a phrase by Wellhaven from one time when I spoke with him about philosophy. Regarding the concept of existence preceding essence, Sartre argued that a fundamental tenet of existentialism is that individuals shape themselves through their existence and cannot be understood through preconceived categories or in essence, imposed by others. Instead, the actual life of the individual constitutes their true essence. 
Human beings, through their consciousness, create their own values and determine the meaning of their lives. This view contrasts with Aristotle and Aquinas, who taught that essence precedes individual existence. While Sartre is often credited with explicitly coining the phrase, existence precedes essence, similar ideas can be found in the works of other existentialist philosophers such as Heidegger and Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard, for example, emphasized the importance of subjective thinking and existence, arguing that the form of communication must be as diverse as the opposites it seeks to reconcile. He believed that the concrete, individual existence should be the primary focus, rather than abstract forms or categories. In existentialism, the imperative to define oneself does not mean that anyone can wish to be anything. Rather, existentialist philosophers argue that such a wish constitutes an inauthentic existence, what Sartre termed, bad faith. Instead, the phrase should be understood to mean that individuals are defined only by their actions and that they are responsible for those actions. For example, someone who acts cruelly towards others is defined as a cruel person by that act, and they are responsible for this new identity. This is in contrast to blaming one's genes or human nature for their actions. Sartre emphasized in his lecture, existentialism is a humanism, that individuals first exist, encounter themselves, and then define themselves through their actions. This implies a positive aspect, individuals can choose to act differently and be good instead of cruel. Jonathan Weber interprets Sartre's use of the term, essence, not as necessary features but as a teleological concept, meaning that an essence is a relational property of having parts ordered to perform some activity. For example, a house has the essence of keeping bad weather out because it has walls and a roof. Humans differ from houses in that they do not have an inbuilt purpose, they are free to choose their purpose and shape their essence, hence, their existence precedes their essence. Sartre advocated a radical conception of freedom, where individuals are solely responsible for their purpose, and their projects have no inherent inertia except what they endorse. On the other hand, Simone de Beauvoir argued that various factors, called sedimentation, offer resistance to changing our direction in life. Sedimentations are products of past choices and can be changed by choosing differently in the present, but this process occurs slowly, shaping the agent's evaluative outlook until the transition is complete. Sartre's definition of existentialism was influenced by Heidegger's work, Being in Time. However, in later correspondence, Heidegger suggested that Sartre misunderstood him, particularly regarding the precedence of actions over being. Heidegger believed that Sartre had merely reversed the roles traditionally attributed to essence and existence without critically exa. The concept of the absurd in existentialist thought suggests that there is no inherent meaning in the world beyond what meaning we ascribe to it. This idea encompasses the notion of life's amorality or unfairness, highlighting a stark contrast with the traditional Abrahamic religious perspective that posits life's purpose as fulfilling God's commandments. According to this religious perspective, meaning is derived from adhering to divine directives. Living a life of absurdity, as proposed by Albert Camus, involves rejecting the search for an overarching meaning in human existence because, ultimately, there is nothing to be found. Camus argues that the world or human beings are not inherently absurd, rather, absurdity arises from the discord between human beings and the world they inhabit. This perspective contrasts with the notion that, bad things don't happen to good people. In the absurd world, there is no inherent distinction between good and bad people, and anything can happen to anyone at any time, regardless of their moral standing. The existentialist literature often portrays individuals who confront the absurdity of the world. These encounters with the absurd can lead to a profound awareness of the meaninglessness of existence, prompt existential questions about life's purpose and the nature of human freedom. Camus famously stated in, The Myth of Sisyphus, that the most serious philosophical problem is suicide. While various existentialist philosophers propose different approaches to addressing the existential crisis posed by the absurd, such as religious faith or perseverance in the face of meaninglessness, they generally share a concern for helping individuals avoid living in ways that deny or ignore the absurdity of existence. In conclusion, the existentialist perspective on the absurd emphasizes the fundamental ambiguity and lack of inherent meaning in human existence, challenging individuals to confront these realities and find ways to live authentically in spite of them. Facticity, as defined by Sartre in, being in nothingness, refers to the objective aspects of one's personal life, or the, in itself, which includes both being and not being. It encompasses the facts of one's existence, such as birthplace, body, identity, and values. 
Heidegger describes facticity as the way in which we are thrown into the world, suggesting that it is a fundamental condition of human existence. Facticity is both a limitation and a condition of freedom. It is a limitation in that much of one's facticity is beyond one's control, such as birthplace or physical attributes. However, it is also a condition of freedom because one's values and choices are often influenced by one's facticity. Despite being set in stone, in terms of the past, facticity does not determine a person, individuals freely ascribe meaning to their facticity. Denying one's facticity, such as by ignoring or rejecting aspects of one's past, is considered inauthentic. Authenticity, according to Sartre, involves acknowledging one's facticity while also projecting oneself into the future. This means recognizing the conditions that shape the present self while also striving to transcend them through future projects and actions. For example, consider two individuals who have committed crimes. One has no memory of his past, while the other remembers everything. The first individual, not burdened by his past, leads a normal life, while the second feels trapped by his past and continues a life of crime. The second individual ascribes meaning to his past that determines his present actions, but this meaning is not inherent in his past, he chooses to interpret his past in a way that influences his present behavior. Inauthenticity arises when one focuses solely on future possibilities without acknowledging or considering one's current facticity. For instance, someone who dreams of a luxurious lifestyle without acknowledging their current financial limitations is inauthentic. Authenticity involves recognizing one's facticity and actively working towards future projects that align with one's values and circumstances, thus shaping a future facticity that reflects these choices. Facticity, in existentialism, is closely tied to the concept of angst, or anxiety. This anxiety arises from the recognition that one's freedom is limited by facticity, or the objective aspects of one's existence. When one's actions are constrained by facticity, and there is no possibility for facticity to intervene and take responsibility for one's actions, angst is produced. Existential freedom also entails the ability to change one's values. Individuals are responsible for their values, regardless of societal norms or expectations. The emphasis on freedom in existentialism highlights the limits of the responsibility one bears as a result of this freedom. The relationship between freedom and responsibility is seen as interdependent, and a clearer understanding of freedom clarifies the scope of one's responsibilities. Authenticity is a key theme in existential thought, emphasizing the importance of living in accordance with one's true self. To live authentically is to act as oneself, not as defined by one's actions, genes, or any other external factor. An authentic existence involves acting in accordance with one's freedom, taking responsibility for one's choices, and not attributing them solely to one's background or circumstances. In terms of authenticity, facticity requires acting based on one's actual values when making choices, rather than choosing randomly or based on external influences. This means taking responsibility for one's actions and decisions, acknowledging that one's values are not predetermined by external factors but are freely chosen. In contrast, inauthenticity is characterized by a denial of living in accordance with one's freedom. This can manifest in various ways, such as pretending that choices are meaningless or random, convincing oneself of some form of determinism, or engaging in mimicry, where one acts as society expects. Mimicry often involves conforming to a social role or image, such as how a bank manager, lion tamer, or sex worker is expected to behave. Sartre, in Being and Nothingness, gives the example of a waiter in Bad Faith, who merely goes through the motions of being a typical waiter, following a prescribed script of behavior. However, not all conformity to social norms is considered inauthentic. The key factor is the individual's attitude towards their own freedom and responsibility, and the extent to which they act in accordance with this freedom. The concept of the other, central to phenomenology, is also important in existentialism. The other is another free subject who experiences the same world as oneself. This experience of the other's perspective helps constitute objectivity and intersubjectivity. When one encounters the other, the world is perceived as objective, existing independently of individual perceptions. This experience of the other's viewpoint is often referred to as the look or the gaze. In existentialism, the experience of the other's look not only constitutes the world as objective but also imposes a limitation on freedom. This is because the look tends to objectify the one being looked at. When one perceives oneself in the look, one is not experienced as nothing or no thing but as a thing or something. 
Sartre illustrates this with the example of a man peeping through a keyhole. Initially, the man is completely absorbed in the act of peeping, but when he hears a noise behind him, he suddenly becomes aware of himself as seen by another person. This awareness fills him with shame, as he sees himself as he would see someone else in the same situation, a peeping Tom. For Sartre, this experience of shame demonstrates the existence of other minds and refutes solipsism. The conscious state of shame requires the awareness of oneself as an object of another's gaze, providing a priori evidence for the existence of other minds. It's important to note that the other's look does not necessarily require the actual presence of another person. The creaking floorboard that the man hears could simply be the house settling, and the look is more about one's perception of how another might perceive them rather than an actual telepathic experience of the other's perspective. Existential despair is a concept closely related to existential angst and is characterized by a profound sense of hopelessness and disillusionment about life. It arises from the recognition of the fundamental freedom and responsibility that comes with existence. In existentialism, despair is not just a feeling of sadness or depression but a deep-seated realization of the absurdity and meaninglessness of life. Kierkegaard, often considered the father of existentialism, explored the concept of despair extensively. He distinguished between two forms of despair, spiritless despair, which is a lack of self-awareness or a refusal to acknowledge one's true self, and despair over oneself, which is a despair rooted in the awareness of one's true self and the burdens of freedom and responsibility that come with it. For Kierkegaard, despair over oneself is a necessary step towards true selfhood and authenticity. By confronting the despair inherent in human existence, one can transcend it and achieve a higher state of being. This process involves taking responsibility for one's choices and actions, embracing one's freedom, and ultimately finding meaning and purpose in life despite its inherent absurdity. Existential despair, as understood in existential philosophy, goes beyond conventional notions of despair as simply a loss of hope. It is a profound sense of hopelessness that arises from the recognition of the fundamental nature of human existence. According to existentialism, individuals are faced with the burden of creating their own meaning and values in a seemingly indifferent or absurd universe. This realization can lead to despair as individuals grapple with the weight of their freedom and responsibility. Existential despair is often linked to the concept of existential angst, which is the anxiety or dread that arises from the awareness of one's freedom and the absence of inherent meaning in life. The existentialist notion of despair is not just a temporary state of sadness or disappointment but a fundamental aspect of the human condition. Kierkegaard, one of the key figures in existentialism, emphasized the importance of confronting despair as a necessary step towards self-awareness and authenticity. For Kierkegaard, despair is not simply a negative emotion to be avoided but a crucial existential challenge that can lead to personal growth and self-discovery. Existentialism is characterized by its opposition to positivism and rationalism, particularly in how it defines human beings. Unlike positivism, which emphasizes empirical observation and scientific methods, and rationalism, which prioritizes reason and logic, existentialism asserts that human beings make decisions based on subjective meaning rather than pure rationality. Existentialists argue that reason is insufficient when it comes to addressing existential problems, such as the meaning of life, freedom, and death. Kierkegaard and Sartre both criticized rationality for its limitations in dealing with existential issues. Kierkegaard suggested that while rationality may be useful for engaging with the objective world, it is inadequate for grappling with existential questions. Sartre, on the other hand, viewed rationality as a form of bad faith, a way for individuals to avoid confronting the irrational and random nature of existence. According to Sartre, by relying on rationality and other forms of bad faith, people restrict their freedom and surrender to external influences, such as societal expectations or the judgments of others. In summary, existentialism challenges the notion that human beings can be fully understood or defined through reason alone, emphasizing instead the importance of subjective experience, freedom, and individual responsibility. In Shaping Human Existence In the context of religion, existentialism offers a unique perspective on the interpretation of religious texts, such as the Bible. An existentialist reading of the Bible emphasizes the reader's role as an existing subject engaging with the text. This approach contrasts with viewing the Bible as a collection of absolute truths external to the reader. Instead, the reader is encouraged to see the text as a reflection of their own existence and to interpret its teachings as internal guides rather than external mandates.
For example, when considering the commandments in the Bible, an existentialist reader would not see them as rules imposed by an external authority but as principles that resonate with their own internal values and beliefs. This approach shifts the focus from obedience to an external agent to personal responsibility and authenticity. Philosophers like Soren Kierkegaard explored the idea of subjective engagement with religious teachings. Kierkegaard suggested that the true challenge lies not in simply understanding religious teachings but in living them out authentically in everyday life. This existentialist approach to religion emphasizes the individual's inner experience and subjective interpretation of religious concepts. Other thinkers, such as Hans Jonas and Rudolf Bultmann, applied existentialist principles to early Christianity and Christian theology. They introduced the concept of existentialist demythologization, which involves interpreting religious myths and narratives in a way that emphasizes their existential significance for the individual believer. Overall, existentialism offers a rich philosophical framework for engaging with religious texts and concepts, encouraging individuals to approach their faith with a sense of personal responsibility, authenticity, and subjective engagement. Existentialism and nihilism are often conflated due to their shared exploration of themes like meaninglessness, anguish, and the human experience of confronting an apparently indifferent universe. However, they are distinct philosophies with different implications. Existentialism acknowledges the absurdity and lack of inherent meaning in the universe but emphasizes the individual's freedom and responsibility to create their own meaning and values. Existentialists, like Kierkegaard and Sartre, argue that even in a meaningless world, individuals can find purpose and significance through their actions and choices. Nihilism, on the other hand, takes a more radical stance, asserting that life is inherently meaningless, and there is no objective basis for value or meaning. Nihilism often leads to a sense of despair or resignation, as it suggests that all efforts to find meaning are ultimately futile. While some existentialist philosophers, like Nietzsche, have been associated with nihilistic ideas, it's crucial to recognize that existentialism does not advocate for a complete rejection of meaning or values. Instead, it encourages individuals to confront the inherent uncertainty and absurdity of existence while embracing their freedom to create meaning in spite of it. Existentialism has roots in European religious thought and philosophy, with precursors like Blaise Pascal and Soren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard is often considered the first existentialist philosopher, emphasizing the individual's responsibility to give meaning to their life and live authentically. Nietzsche, another important figure, focused on subjective human experience and the idea of individuals creating their own values and meaning. Both thinkers explored the human struggle with the apparent meaninglessness of life and the role of free choice in defining one's existence. Their ideas have influenced not only existentialism but also other intellectual movements, such as postmodernism and various forms of psychotherapy. Nietzsche's concept of, existence precedes essence, reflects the existentialist idea that individuals are not predetermined by any external factors, including God or society. He emphasizes the idea that humans are responsible for creating their own identities and meanings in life. By rejecting the existence of God, Nietzsche also rejects the notion of a predestined purpose for humanity. Dostoevsky's work, particularly in Notes from Underground and The Brothers Karamazov, also explores themes relevant to existentialism. In Notes from Underground, the protagonist struggles to fit into society and grapples with the identities he constructs for himself, highlighting the theme of individual freedom and responsibility. Sartre, in his work, Existentialism as a Humanism, refers to, the brothers Karamazov, as an example of an existential crisis. While Dostoevsky's novels often delve into existential themes, they also incorporate religious and moral dimensions, with characters often experiencing a transition toward a Christian Orthodox worldview, reflecting Dostoevsky's own beliefs. In the early 20th century, Several philosophers and writers explored existentialist ideas, contributing to the development of the existentialist movement. Miguel de Unamuno y Jugo, a Spanish philosopher, emphasized the importance of life in the physical world over abstract rationalism in his 1913 work, The Tragic Sense of Life in Men and Nations. Unamuno rejected systematic philosophy in favor of individual faith quests, often characterized by their tragic or absurd nature, as seen in his interest in the character of Don Quixote. Another Spanish thinker, José Ortega y Gasset, wrote in 1914 that human existence is always defined by the combination of the individual person and the concrete circumstances of their life. This idea is captured in his famous phrase, Yo soy yo y mi circunstancia, I am myself and my circumstances. 
This view aligns with Sartre's belief that human existence is always situated in a specific context. Martin Buber, though writing in German and associated with German philosophy, stood apart from the mainstream of German thought. Born into a Jewish family in Vienna, he was also involved in Jewish culture, Zionism, and Hasidism. His 1922 book, I and Thou, is his best-known work, emphasizing the fundamental importance of human dialogue and relationships, which he believed was often overlooked by scientific and philosophical thought. Buber's concept of das Zwischenmenschlich, or the sphere of between, highlights the relational aspect of human existence. Lev Shestov and Nikolai Berdyaev, two Russian philosophers, became known as existentialist thinkers during their exiles in Paris after the Russian Revolution. Shestov criticized rationalism and systematization in philosophy early on, as seen in his 1905 book, All Things Are Possible. Berdyaev distinguished between the world of spirit and the everyday world of objects, arguing that human freedom is rooted in the realm of spirit, independent of scientific notions of causation. According to Berdyaev, living in the objective world estranges individuals from authentic spiritual freedom, and humans are to be seen as beings created in God's image, capable of free, creative acts. His major work, The Destiny of Man, published in 1931, elaborates on these themes. Gabriel Marcel, a French philosopher and dramatist, introduced important existentialist themes in his early essay, Existence and Objectivity, 1925, and his, Metaphysical Journal, 1927 before the term, Existentialism, was coined. Marcel emphasized metaphysical alienation, with individuals seeking harmony in a transient life. He advocated for secondary reflection, a dialogical approach open to wonder, astonishment, and the presence of others and God, contrasting it with the abstract, scientific technical primary reflection associated with the Cartesian ego. Marcel saw philosophy as a concrete activity undertaken by a sensing, feeling human being incarnate in a concrete world. Unlike Sartre, Marcel was a Christian and converted to Catholicism in 1929, leading to significant differences in their philosophies. In Germany, Karl Jaspers, a psychologist and philosopher, described his own thought, heavily influenced by Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, as existence philosophy, which he defined as the way of thought through which individuals seek to become themselves. Jaspers emphasized that existence philosophy does not focus on cognizing objects but on elucidating and actualizing the being of the thinker. Jaspers, a professor at the University of Heidelberg, was acquainted with Martin Heidegger, who held a professorship at Marburg before moving to Freiburg in 1928. Although Jaspers and Heidegger shared an admiration for Kierkegaard and engaged in philosophical discussions, they became estranged over Heidegger's support of National Socialism. Heidegger, in his work, Being and Time, presented a method of grounding philosophical explanations in human existence Dason analyzed in terms of existential categories existential. This has led to debates about whether Heidegger should be considered an existentialist. After World War II, existentialism became a well-known and significant philosophical and cultural movement, largely due to the public prominence of two French writers, Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus. Sartre and Camus wrote best-selling novels, plays, widely read journalism, and theoretical texts, contributing to the popularization of existentialist ideas. These years also saw the growing reputation of Heidegger's, being in time, outside Germany. Sartre explored existentialist themes in his 1938 novel, Nausea, and the short stories in his 1939 collection, The Wall. However, it was in the two years following the liberation of Paris from German occupation that Sartre and his close associates, such as Camus, Simone de Beauvoir, and Maurice Merleau-Ponty, became internationally famous as the leading figures of the existentialist movement. Camus and Sartre, in particular, became the leading public intellectuals of post-war France, achieving fame that reached across all audiences. Camus was an editor of the popular leftist newspaper Combat, while Sartre launched his journal of leftist thought, Les Temps Modernes. Beauvoir noted that existentialism became the first media craze of the post-war era. By the end of 1947, Camus' earlier works had been reprinted, his new play, Caligula, had been performed, and his novel, The Plague, had been published. Sartre's first two novels of the Roads to Freedom trilogy had appeared, as had Beauvoir's novel, The Blood of Others. Works by Camus and Sartre were being published in foreign editions, solidifying the fame of the Paris-based existentialists. Sartre had traveled to Germany in 1930 to study the phenomenology of Husserl and Heidegger, 
and he included critical comments on their work in his major treatise, Being and Nothingness. Heidegger's thought had also become known in French philosophical circles through its use by Alexander Kajev in explicating Hegel in lectures given in Paris in the 1930s. These lectures were highly influential, with attendees including Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, Raymond Queno, Georges Bataille, Louis Althusser, André Breton, and Jacques Lacan. Heidegger's essays began to appear in French philosophy journals, further influencing French existentialist thought. Heidegger initially praised Sartre's work, recognizing an independent thinker who deeply understood the foundations of his philosophy. However, in response to a question posed by Jean Beaufret, Heidegger distanced himself from Sartre's position and existentialism in general in his letter on humanism. Sartre attempted to reconcile existentialism and Marxism in his work, Critique of Dialectical Reason. Throughout his writings, a major theme was freedom and responsibility. Camus, a friend of Sartre until their falling out, wrote several works with existential themes, including The Rebel, Summer in Algiers, The Myth of Sisyphus, and The Stranger. Camus rejected the existentialist label, considering his works concerned with facing the absurd. In The Myth of Sisyphus, Camus uses the analogy of Sisyphus to demonstrate the futility of existence but argues that Sisyphus finds meaning and purpose in his task. Simone de Beauvoir, an important existentialist and Sartre's partner, wrote about feminist and existentialist ethics in her works, including The Second Sex and The Ethics of Ambiguity. She integrated existentialism with feminism, which was unconventional at the time. Paul Tillich, an existentialist theologian following Kierkegaard and Karl Barth, applied existentialist concepts to Christian theology in his work, The Courage to Be. Rudolf Bultmann used Kierkegaard's and Heidegger's philosophy to demythologize Christianity, interpreting Christian concepts into existentialist ones. Paul Tillich, an important existentialist theologian following Kierkegaard and Karl Barth, applied existentialist concepts to Christian theology and helped introduce existential theology to the general public. His seminal work, The Courage to Be, follows Kierkegaard's analysis of anxiety and life's absurdity but argues that modern humans must achieve selfhood through God despite life's absurdity. Rudolf Bultmann used Kierkegaard's and Heidegger's philosophy to demythologize Christianity, interpreting Christian concepts into existentialist ones. Maurice Merleau-Ponty, an existential phenomenologist and companion of Sartre for a time, authored Phenomenology of Perception, 1945, which was recognized as a major statement of French existentialism. Merleau-Ponty's work, Humanism and Terror, greatly influenced Sartre, although they later disagreed irreparably, dividing existentialists such as de Beauvoir, who sided with Sartre. Colin Wilson, an English writer, published The Outsider in 1956, attempting to reinvigorate what he perceived as a pessimistic philosophy and bring it to a wider audience. Despite initial critical acclaim, Wilson was not academically trained, and his work was criticized by professional philosophers for lacking rigor and critical standards. Art and film have often drawn inspiration from existentialist themes, reflecting on the human condition, freedom, and the search for meaning. For example, Stanley Kubrick's Paths of Glory explores the absurdity of war and existentialist ethics. Orson Welles's The Trial adapts Franz Kafka's work to delve into existential and absurdist themes. Japanese anime series like Neon Genesis Evangelion also tackle existential issues, drawing from Sartre and Kierkegaard. Many contemporary films, such as Melancholia, Fight Club, and The Matrix, as well as classics like The Seventh Seal and a Clockwork Orange, exhibit existentialist qualities. Directors like Ingmar Bergman, Stanley Kubrick, Akira Kurosawa, and Christopher Nolan are known for their exploration of existential themes. These works offer viewers a deep reflection on existence, individuality, and the meaning of life. Existential themes have permeated modern literature since the 1920s, with notable works embodying these ideas. Louis Ferdinand Céline's Journey to the End of the Night, is considered a proto-existential novel, exploring themes later prominent in existential literature. Jean-Paul Sartre's novel, Nausea, is steeped in existential ideas, serving as an accessible introduction to his philosophical stance. Other authors such as Albert Camus, Franz Kafka, Rainer Maria Rilke, T. S. Eliot, Herman Hesse, Luigi Pirandello, Ralph Ellison, and Jack Kerouac have also incorporated existential or proto-existential elements into their works. Even in pulp literature, writers like H. P. 
P. Lovecraft have depicted existential themes, particularly in portraying man's lack of control over his fate. Existential themes are prevalent in theater, particularly in the theater of the absurd. Jean-Paul Sartre's play, No Exit, explores existential ideas, notably the concept that, hell is other people. The play depicts three characters trapped in a room in hell, where they realize they are there to torture each other by probing each other's sins, desires, and memories. Samuel Beckett's, Waiting for Godot, is another prominent example of existentialist theater. The play features two characters waiting endlessly for someone named Godot, who never arrives. Through their interactions, the play delves into themes of human experience, the meaning of existence, and the place of God in life. Tom Stoppard's, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, is an absurdist tragicomedy that reimagines the story of two minor characters from Shakespeare's, Hamlet. Like, Waiting for Godot, the play explores themes of existentialism through the characters' philosophical musing and their struggle to understand the irrationality of the world. These plays, among others in the theater of the absurd, use absurd and surreal elements to convey the existential angst and absurdity of human existence. Jean Anouilly's Antigone, is another play that delves into existentialist ideas. Inspired by the Greek myth and Sophocles' play of the same name, Antigone, was first performed in Paris in 1944 during the Nazi occupation of France. The play, produced under Nazi censorship, is ambiguous in its treatment of authority, with Antigone representing the rejection of authority and Creon representing acceptance of it. The play has been interpreted as a reflection of the French resistance and the Nazi occupation, with Antigone's refusal to accept a meaningless life and her choice of death over a mediocre existence. Martin Eslin, in his book, Theater of the Absurd, highlighted how many contemporary playwrights, including Samuel Beckett, Eugene Ionesco, Jean Genet, and Arthur Adamov, incorporated existentialist beliefs into their works. These playwrights often portrayed characters navigating a world devoid of inherent meaning, reflecting the existentialist notion of the absurdity of human existence. While these playwrights often distanced themselves from explicit existentialist labels, preferring associations with movements like, Pataphysics or surrealism, they are often linked to existentialism due to their thematic explorations of the human condition. Black existentialism is a branch of existentialism that focuses on the existence and experiences of black people in the world. It includes thinkers such as C.L.R. James, Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Dubois, France Fanon, Angela Davis, Cornel West, Naomi Zak, Bell Hooks, Stuart Hall, Louis Gordon, and Our Lord, among others. Existentialist Psychology and psychoanalysis are offshoots of existentialism that have influenced various fields, including psychotherapy. Otto Rank, a close associate of Freud, and Ludwig Binswanger, influenced by Freud, Husserl, Heidegger, and Sartre, were early contributors to existentialist psychology. Viktor Frankl developed logotherapy, a form of existentialist therapy. Rollo May, strongly influenced by Kierkegaard and Otto Rank, was an early contributor to existentialist psychology in the United States. Irvin D. Yalom is one of the most prolific writers on techniques and theory of existentialist psychology in the U.S. Other contributors to existentialist psychology include Medard Boss, Eugene Minkowski, V. E. Gebsaddle, Roland Kuhn, G. Caruso, F. T. Beitendek, G. Valley, and Viktor Frankl. Emmy van Derzen, a British-based psychotherapist, has contributed to the development of a European version of existentialist psychotherapy. Anxiety is a central theme in existentialism and is often addressed in psychotherapy. Existentialist therapists explain anxiety as stemming from an individual's freedom to make decisions and the responsibility that comes with it. They believe that embracing anxiety can lead to personal growth and positive change. Humanistic psychology, which shares many principles with existentialism, has also been influenced by existentialist psychology. Terror management theory, based on the work of Ernest Becker and Otto Rank, is a field of study within psychology that examines people's emotional reactions to the awareness of their own mortality. Gerd B. Ackenbach has contributed to the tradition of philosophical counseling, drawing on Socratic principles. Michel Weber has also made contributions to philosophical counseling through his Chromatique Center in Belgium. Existentialism has faced several criticisms over the years. Unsound methods and contempt for reason. Walter Kaufman criticized existentialism for its unsound methods and its contempt for reason, suggesting that these aspects are prominent in existentialist thought. Confusion about, to be, and being, 
logical positivist philosophers like Rudolf Carnap and A.J. Ayer have argued that existentialists often misuse the verb, to be, in their analyses of, being, claiming that existentialists are confused about the transitive nature of the verb and its connection to a predicate. Self-created difficulties. Some critics, like Colin Wilson, suggest that existentialism has created its own difficulties, citing a tendency towards laziness and boredom in post-romantic philosophy, which has led existentialism into a whole of its own making. Sartre's philosophy. Critics have also targeted Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy, arguing that it is contradictory. Herbert Marcuse, for example, criticized Sartre's, being and nothingness, for projecting anxiety and meaninglessness onto existence itself, suggesting that existentialism, in this sense, becomes part of the very ideology it seeks to critique. These criticisms highlight various philosophical, methodological, and logical challenges that existentialism has faced. Critics of Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy often point to what they see as contradictions within his ideas. One such critic, Magda Stroh, argues that Sartre's philosophy contains metaphysical arguments despite his claim that his views ignore metaphysics. Stroh and others suggest that Sartre's assertion that existence precedes essence is itself a metaphysical statement, contradicting his attempt to distance himself from traditional metaphysical thinking. Herbert Marcuse, in his critique of Sartre's, being and nothingness, accuses existentialism of projecting anxiety and meaninglessness onto the nature of existence. Marcuse argues that by hypostatizing specific historical conditions of human existence into ontological and metaphysical characteristics, existentialism becomes part of the very ideology it seeks to critique, leading to an illusory radicalism. Martin Heidegger, in his Letter on Humanism, also criticizes Sartre's existentialism, suggesting that Sartre remains within the confines of metaphysics despite his attempt to move beyond it. Heidegger argues that Sartre's assertion that existence precedes essence is itself a metaphysical statement, as it relies on a traditional understanding of the relationship between existence and essence. These criticisms highlight some of the challenges and contradictions within Sartre's philosophy, particularly regarding his attempts to break free from traditional metaphysical thinking while still engaging with metaphysical concepts.